back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. I always look forward to speaking to my next guest. She is an author, a cultural critic, and she also writes for the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, which can be found at, quickly let me look it up here, ineteconomics.org. Org, Lynn Paramore uh, joins us now. So first of all, Lynn, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I wanted to start, you've written a number of good pieces lately um, on a broad array of topics, but one of the ones I wanted to start talking about, maybe we'll get out of economics after a certain point, uh, but the one that uh, you recently wrote, I think it's your most recent piece uh, at INET Economics that I think is very important is a piece entitled, uh, headlined, uh, Stock Buybacks Stand in the Way of Biden's Infrastructure Plan. And I think this is so important for people to understand that I wanted to go over it with you yeah. briefly. So maybe we could start, rather than I uh, try to uh, summarize your work, maybe you could, uh, if you don't mind summarizing what you had to say here. Absolutely. And I should say that I, I learned about the phenomenon of stock buybacks and why there's such a problem from a really wonderful economist named William Lazonic, who has written extensively on this topic. Um, stock buybacks are a form of stock price manipulation. And what happens is a company will take its profits, its money, its resources, and instead of using it to do things like research and development or pay its workers more, retain talent, all the wonderful things it could do with the money. Instead, it buys outstanding shares of its own stock. Now, why would a company do that? Well, a company would do that because when they buy shares of their own stock, then there are fewer shares and the price of each share increases. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to quickly jack up the price of the stock. And companies uh, often do that under pressure from investors, particularly uh, in recent decades, hedge fund managers who, who have bought shares of a company and they want to make a quick profit. Some people call it a pump and dump. They want to get that stock price up, then they want to dump their stock and head out. This a uh, phenomenon of stock buybacks used to be unlawful before 1982, but in came the Reagan administration. It was very Wall Street friendly. You probably remember the 80s. It was like uh, Wall Street was kind of on fire. You had Oliver Stone's movie, Greed is Good, kind of giving you the Gordon Gecko greed is good mentality that, that was uh, so popular in those days. And stock buybacks were once again made lawful, made legal. So that has had a very unfortunate impact on many wonderful companies that we need to do these big projects like a Green New Deal or an infrastructure project. You know, the government can't just uh, pull semiconductor chips out of thin air. It needs a, a company with the know-how and uh, the ability to design and manufacture these things. But when you have these hedge fund managers circling around uh, companies like Intel, for example, that make semiconductor chips, you will see that they start doing stock buybacks under pressure from the hedge fund managers. And before you know it, they're not investing in their capabilities. And sometimes they're really left um, shadows of their former selves. It's a little bit like what used to happen with corporate raiders who would come in and take a, buy a company, strip it down, fire everyone, and leave with, hit the road with the money. This is a little different in that the hedge fund managers don't, have, they don't actually have to buy the company, they just buy enough shares to exert pressure. So stock buybacks are something that a lot of people, including this uh, economist, William Lazonic, and, 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 and actually um, an increasing number of politicians like Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, um, and even Biden himself uh, really think that stock buybacks are a problem and shouldn't be happening. And at the very least, a company that would be getting taxpayer money, that would be getting subsidies for something like an infrastructure plan, they definitely should not be doing stock buybacks. You know, this is such an important point, Lynn, that, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that people 
get it that in fact number one that stock buybacks benefit these hedge fund managers who get you know large blocks of uh, you know voting shares in a corporation and of course they benefit the executives who run the corporation as well because their incentive packages their compensation is large now the majority of it comes in the form of stocks as i understand it so anything they can do to jack up the the stock price enriches them personally but the things that uh, are of benefit to a corporation and its workers and societies over society overall things like long term investment things like hiring uh, you know when you need to hire and not trying to cut corners on wages or or, or jobs uh, all those things take a back seat it's why i sometimes say that every corporate executive now is basically uh, a financial uh, executive and not you know they may on paper run a manufacturing corporation or what have you transportation corporation but if it's publicly traded they're managing to the quarterly bottom line uh yeah. they're more so they're more like Wall Streeters in a yeah. way. I think you just hit the nail on the uh, the nail on the head. The Wall Street mentality is very short term, and when company executives start thinking that way, it really is uh, has a te terrible influence on the long term longevity and sustainability of the company and what it can do. As an example, Steve Jobs at Apple really was a visionary and he was interested in Apple being part of the clean technology future that actually meant something to him but you know come time when Tim Cook is uh, running the show he becomes uh, vulnerable to Carl Icahn's pressure Carl Icahn came in there and bought up shares of Apple stock and started pressuring him to do buybacks and jack that stock price up and Icahn put a lot of pressure on him he used his public platform, his Twitter platform, all of this to get Cook to do buybacks. And sure enough, that's what happened. And you don't really see Apple investing in the clean technology things. It might have been part of, you know, batteries or, you know, uh, electric vehicles, all kinds of things it could have been involved in. But instead, what does it do? Well, it makes some nice phones and watches. Those are great. But it could have been a leader in our future uh, sustainability, you know, it's, a, it's something that really means a lot to the country. And instead, it's, it's going to take a back seat, most likely. Well, and and that's the piece I wanted to pivot to now, because, uh, you know, as I read your piece, Lynn Paramore, uh, you know, sort of image of a leaky sieve came to mind, right? It's a kind of trying to pour uh, coffee into a colander and then drink it or something. It's like, I had this image of, uh, you know, the people of the United States in the form of their elected representatives deciding that they want to invest in the climate, in jobs, in infrastructure, in all the things we care about. And so they pour this wealth into uh, corporate America that because largely, although other reasons too, but because of this stock buyback uh, factor uh, is like, a, you know, just is going to could pour right out again, or a lot of it could, in the form of stock buybacks. And I think that was essentially your point, right? Yeah, that's right. And I don't know about you, but I suspect you're on the same page, and most of your viewers would be. I don't want my taxpayer money going to fund a new super yacht for a hedge fund manager. The hedge fund managers we're talking about, people like Carl Icahn, uh, people like Nelson Peltz, people like Daniel Loeb, they are billionaires many times over. They don't need any more money. They certainly don't need our taxpayer money, which is another reason why for companies involved with a, a, a major uh, government project, th these stock buybacks should be off the table, at least for the duration of the contract until we can get enough political will to make stock buybacks unlawful as they should be and as they were before 1982. But for sure, uh, we don't need to be funneling our money into those channels. And guess which country does not have this problem? That would be China. Stock right. buybacks are not a thing that is going on in China. And a big company like Huawei, for example, they don't have to worry about stock buybacks. The, the, uh, the profits that they make can be funneled into the things uh, that, that we wish our 
corporations were doing, like retaining uh, and attracting the best talent, like investing in manufacturing capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. China is, uh, has a major advantage over us in that area. Well, and for any listeners who might be uh, thinking, well, they're commies, you know, who cares? Uh, I would also point out that another country where people didn't have to worry about stock buybacks was the United States under Dwight D. Eisenhower, for okay. example, and other Republican presidents, because as you point out, these things used to be illegal. And right. to me, and by the way, not only don't I want a hedge funder to buy another yacht with public money meant for a good purpose. I don't want a corporate executive to buy another yacht with that money either. That's why I, I objected, for example, to the bailout of Boeing that had been so badly mismanaged, where these guys had been, and they are men, uh, had been dishing out large uh, um, bonuses to themselves, dividends, buybacks, and then come with their hand out to the American people and get their hand filled with American cash. That, to me, is also disturbing. Uh, but the hedge funds, the hedge funders do make an ideal villain. So in that sense, from a... Yeah, they, they don't do themselves any favors in the way they operate um, whatsoever. No. And I did write a piece about Daniel Loeb, who you mentioned uh, oh. once called the, the Robespierre of the hedge fund revolution. Is how I describe Loeb. He is a particular... Well, they're all, they're not a likable bunch by and large. Um, yeah, right into that Oliver Stone movie, you know, they're right up there with Gordon Gecko. Right. And I don't know if you read this. You probably did. But Oliver Stone said years later he was astonished that Gordon Gecko was a hero to so many people on Wall Street. That they all were, yeah, this guy's great. He meant him to be like a te textbook villain. And he was, if anything, just worried he was too cartoonishly evil. And of course, you can't be too cartoonishly evil for some of these characters. So uh, what, Lynn Paramore, what would you say are the solutions. I mean, obviously the interim one is no Green New Deal or infrastructure money for um, corporations that engage in stock buybacks. Would that be one of them? Or Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, part of what I've been trying to do is to be part of the effort to really educate the public on this matter. Because it's, you know, these Wall Street shenanigans, they sound a little bit arcane, but they're they're really um, not that hard to understand if you begin to sort of break it down and you see what these guys are doing. And, and, and I think the public needs to put pressure on the representatives to, um, to, to, to really make this a central issue. And I think also to recognize how great a role it plays in our economy right now. One of the things that Biden said he wanted to do with this infrastructure project was to make American companies and American jobs, you know, competitive with China. Well, guess what? That's not going to happen as long as these stock buybacks are, get, are going on. Um, let me just give you an example. Coming back to Intel, the semiconductor right. chip company, not many companies in the world manufacture semiconductor chips. It's a hugely capital intensive project. Uh, very few companies do it. And Intel is the one company that the United States has. It's based in California that can do this. But if the hedge fund managers have their way, if Daniel Loeb has his way, Intel will split off that part of its um, of its corporation and stick to just designing semiconductor chips. Now, what does that mean? It means that the leaders in semiconductor chip technology right now, which happen to be the Taiwanese, may very well end up buying that part of Intel's uh, uh, capabilities, the manufacturing. And then the United States won't have anybody that manufactures chips. Now, you need these chips in everything nowadays, everything that has a computer, everything that has an electrical system, your car, your phone, electric vehicles, uh, you know, you name it, electric grids. And so that becomes very worrisome if all of that capability um, is, is inaccessible to the United States because the Taiwanese were able to take advantage of our buyback created mess. Right. And, and and I would only add to that that if if there if 100 percent of the world's uh, um, uh, chips are manufactured offshore on the other side of the world, we've already seen what a pandemic can do to our supply chains. And we're, we're making ourselves even more vulnerable to what is, you know, legitimately a national security risk. And, Absolutely. And, 
And Lynn, while we were talking, I was trying to think of the right like analogy for stock buybacks. And the best I could think of was, you know, if there's a neighborhood baker who makes great bread and it's three bucks a loaf and everybody loves it, but somehow she figures out how she can get your money to buy up a whole bunch of loaves and freeze them so that the bread, instead of being three bucks, is now eight bucks. And you're the one who gave her the money to buy up all the bread loaves. So it's too, you know, I mean, it's like, and then she's not making as much bread because she's just uh, shifting money back. I mean, that to me is what stock buybacks are to the broader economy. Is that a lame metaphor? Yeah, and her workers are not getting paid. Uh, they're not getting raises. Right. They're they're, and she's not she's not able to use the funds, uh, the profits to attract the best uh, bakers out there. And so the product quality is going to go down. Right, and it's going to be cost more. So I, I had asked you, but I think we dropped off. Was that a lame metaphor? No, for the I think these are great, and it's wonderful to play around with them and and to help people really understand what this uh what this little wall street trick is all about because it's really just um it's an illusion it's a trick you know jacking the stock price up not because a company has made better bread or has some wonderful right. long-term bread vision no it's just playing wall street tricks and pumping that stock up in the short term to make somebody rich who is you know ready to uh buy you know a a, a, a new mansion down in florida or whatever which is why we have so many crap companies in this country, if you ask me. So now I want to change uh, direction completely and uh, talk to you about something completely different, which is this piece you wrote uh, and title, let me see if I can find it, for NBC News uh, editorial page. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I wrote something for them to think or big think or something. But uh, the piece is, which I have right in front of me, it's called uh, The Women Who Are Giving Up Alcohol to Fight the Patriarchy. And you you yeah. you play off the film, the new film, A Promising Young Woman or Promising Young Woman. Um, she takes uh, revenge on men who prey on uh, women who get inebriated in bars. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, first of all, I just think it's a great topic, but I'll start with this. Uh, I haven't seen Promising Young Woman. Is it a good movie? Should I see it? It is a really interesting film. I won't say it's a perfect film, but it is really interesting. And I mean, I, I give it a thumbs up. Uh, Carrie Mulligan is really wonderful in it. And it was a little horrifying to watch. I was brought back to my college days and my younger days, you know, running around in New York City, I can't tell you how many times I was inebriated in situations that were dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for so many uh, people I know, women, and of course, men are not immune to being preyed on when they're inebriated either. And it really hit home to me how much in my own personal case, alcohol had not played a very positive role. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said this on Facebook and I've said it, you know, in public forums, so I don't mind saying it here, but I experienced sexual assault when I was a teenager in an alcohol fueled situation. So it's a really personal issue to me. And I began to think about the relationship between women and alcohol. And I happened to see of all things, an Instagram post by Chrissy Teigen, uh -huh. who is the uh, model and celebrity married to John Legend. And she said that she had just stopped drinking and she'd read this book by a woman named Holly Whitaker called Quit Like a Woman. And I uh -huh. thought, well, that sounds interesting. I got to check that out. And it surely was interesting. Holly Whitaker uh, had an, a severe alcohol problem. She was working out in Silicon Valley a few years ago. And kind of part of that bro culture out there and the alcohol was really in not playing a healthy role in her life at all. And she tried uh, some different methods of quitting. She tried AA, but she found that they didn't quite resonate with her. And one uh -huh. of the things that she noticed about AA is she didn't feel that the AA uh, meetings that she went to were necessarily um, inclusive enough for women uh, in particular and minorities to some degree. 
And she found that one of the tenets uh, or, or, uh, of, of, uh, of AA that tended to hit her the wrong way was this idea of um, surrendering and really uh, mm. getting in touch with humility and, you know, apologizing. Now, that is a really important step for many, many people, hugely important, and she doesn't discount that. But sometimes for women and minorities who have been sort of apologizing all their lives for themselves, it, can, right. it might not quite hit the, the right way. Maybe what you need more than surrender is a sense of your own voice and, and, and a sense of being present and a sense of, of uh, you know, empowerment. So that's just one example of how the experience can be a little different. So she, um, she began to create her, her own system of quitting, uh, and she has a, a whole program called Tempest. And I found that it really resonated with me. Um, I actually have stopped drinking after reading her book. And I'm, you know, I couldn't feel better. I actually feel great. It was something that had been slowly happening for a long time, but that her book was kind of the nail in the alcohol coffin for me. So I was really ha happy to find that this discussion about women and alcohol was happening. And there were um, programs and approaches out there that gave uh, people a choice and women and, and minorities in particular more choices about how to quit. You know, I, I it's so interesting to me, Lynn Paramore, and I have a sort of whole uh, uh, complex or galaxy of a response constellation, I guess is what I'm looking for, of responses to it. One of which is when I first read your piece and I saw this about uh, quitting like a woman, I thought, no, wait a minute. It's the men who should quit because, you know, the men are the predators here. The women, I mean, so I wanted to, number one, and I know you better than this, so I didn't think this would happen, but I wanted to... Number one, as I read it, make sure that nobody interpreted it to mean, because uh, we've heard it before, well, then these women shouldn't be drinking, they shouldn't wear short skirts, they, you know, whatever, this victim blaming. And I wanted to make sure it wasn't that. But on the other hand, you know, and I think what comes through in your piece is, uh, you know, there's, uh, you don't have to be victim blaming in order to understand that there's a place for rational self-care in the world, right? So, so, um, and I think that's where your piece, yeah. and I suspect where this program comes down, is the context of rational self-care. And then when it comes to, you know, AA and, um, you know, bearing in mind that AA preaches anonymity at the level of press, radio, and film. I've been around that world for a long, long, long time. And um, 26 years, as a matter of fact. And I guess, you know, I have many feelings about that as well. I can certainly understand how it would be uncomfortable for women, for gay people, for non-binary people. It was uncomfortable for me in the sense that a lot of the language is archaic. A lot of the social modalities reflected in the way it's designed are archaic. I was fascinated by this idea of submission being, uh, you know, meaning something very different to women. And, and I do know that many women of my acquaintance navigate that by, uh, uh, you know, women's meetings and, and, and open discussion of those issues and that making amends does not have to be submission in that sense. But I know that the concept of submission, submission to the will of God, which in AA literature, to be honest, is often reflected in kind of patriarchal image yeah. of God, is, is all, uh, it's all present. It's all there. So I'm of the opinion that whatever helps people, whatever reduces the sum total of human suffering is great with me. And I'm intrigued. I actually want to learn more about this program. Obviously not. I'm satisfied with the path I'm on, but to know more for those around me and those close to me and so on. So, and because it seems to me that it's an interesting topic, it's a fascinating idea. So, um, and you know, you, you think about, um, people have different relationships with alcohol. And one of the things right. that Holly notes is that women do have a different relationship to alcohol than men uh, for no other, you know, if for no other reason, then we have a different biology. Um, mm -hmm. We actually process alcohol somewhat differently. We um, get intoxicated faster. Uh, there's evidence that um, we may, uh, 
suffer liver damage at, you know, drinking, uh, uh, for a shorter time period, that we're sort of more vulnerable to alcohol's negative physiological effects. And, you know, the, the whole rape culture issue, you're exactly right to point out that we're not victim blaming here. We're not saying that um, women in any way, shape or, or form deserve to be the victims of crimes when they, when they drink. But um, there's also a lot of evidence that points to the fact that many, a, a large percentage of se sexual assaults uh, have alcohol in the milieu involved and so it's it's a reality and it's a reality that a lot of women with uh, very um terrible consequences of course no one should ever uh you know sexually approach a person who is inebriated or passed out i mean that's a that's a crime but um but women do have a different relationship with alcohol and they even have a different relationship with alcohol in terms of the way the advertising industry the way big alcohol has approached them um it was interesting in, i started doing research and learning about the 20s during prohibition that was a uh -huh. moment when a lot of women were becoming more free in society and part of that freedom was associated with going to speakeasies um, there were women who ran speakeasies who were these big colorful characters and that seemed empowering and they were, of course, women were smoking too. Right. But unfortunately, um, this had negative consequences uh, for the health of a lot of women. And when Billy, when big alcohol saw saw that even after prohibition uh, was lifted, women still weren't drinking quite as much as men. They began to target women the mm -hmm. same way that big tobacco targeted them with the Virginia Slims. You've come a long mm -hmm. way, baby. You can see it in advertisements now. Uh, a lot of alcohol products are deliberately targeted to women. And, and that really um, upsets me when I think about it. When I think about women just coming out and, and, and uh, being able to use their rights to vote and participate in society and, and, and being targeted by these companies who just want to make a buck off of uh, what could be tremendous damage to their health. It, it really kind of pisses me off. <laughs> Well, no, absolutely. You're, I, I understand that emotion entirely. I also think there's another uh, interesting dimension to it and, and it may be very related to this program, uh, this Tempest program, which is, <laughs> I know many recovered alcoholic women who in hearing their stories, my takeaway is that many of them drank to anesthetize the pain of being a woman in a society that did not allow them to fulfill themselves, their greatest potential, that they drank, many of them drank because men wanted to, especially men, uh, wanted to exploit them sexually and the only way they could, they, they felt they needed to comply with that, but the only way they could do that was drink enough so that they weren't entirely present. Uh, you know, I mean, I think there are all this multiplicity of reasons for, and you know, I mean, I know uh, people say, well, you drink because you're an alcoholic, that's the AA literature, but but uh, I'll unpack that box and that can mean a lot of different things, right? So, uh, whereas men may drink because uh, they're on, speaking for myself, because I was uncomfortable with uh, the male roles I was expected to fulfill or whatever it might be, um, but a lot of it is to, and I would argue, being the lefty that I am, that a lot of drinking takes place, including some of my, a lot of my own, to alleviate the pain of functioning in a capitalist society that alienates you. So yeah. whatever it may be, I think there's a different uh, uh, array of triggers and motivations for women. And there are, of course, many women's meetings and 12-step programs and and, and and literature and speakers that address women directly. But I would say, you know, there's certainly room to uh, to explore that further. And I know a lot of women come into AA and they hear some of the stuff. You know, there was a chapter, it may be changed now, but in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there was a chapter, essentially all the time I went to meetings, called Two Wives. And it was, okay, your husband's a drinker, but it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, women come into AA to get sober and there's a, to wives, well, what about to husbands, to partners, to, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, there's work to be done in that area. And yeah. I, it, it's fascinating, but um, do you see, how do I put this? 
do you see hopes for change in the media uh, aspect of this? Because it seems to me we've had not just advertising, but a media culture that's tended to glorify drinking, going back to the Thin Man movies of the 1930s, if you've ever seen sure. them. You know, Nick and Nora Charles always drunk and, you know, uh, drinking the martinis and solving crimes. And uh, obviously Promising Young Woman is a step in the right direction in terms of, I would argue anyway, in terms yeah. of sort of popular culture or, or artistic response to this. Are there any others like that out there? I've noticed in country music, by the way, that there have been over the years several songs against alcoholism by famous uh, alcohol by brad paisley and there was one called that's why i'm here which is about an aa meeting i've been there and that's why i'm here is the refrain so uh, but i'm just wondering i don't see that popular culture shift quite. yeah you know and i think that's one of the reasons why a promising young woman seems so fresh to me because there hasn't been a lot of um attention and and, and a sense of this tremendous empowerment. I don't want to give too much of the story away, but Carrie Mulligan's character um, is seeking revenge on uh, a, a sexual assault that her best friend uh, suffered by, by essentially going after men who prey on inebriated women, but she does so dead sober. Carrie oh. Mulligan herself doesn't drink, but she pretends to be drunk in order to lure men who have this predatory uh, MO, you know, to lure them into her trap. But, you know, I hadn't seen that before. And that's one of the reasons I thought this is such an interesting twist on, you know, kind of the rape revenge stories that we started seeing in the 70s, um, as, as well as movies about male predators. It's a really interesting flip. So I think this is a fairly new thing. And also for celebrities like Chrissy Teigen, who is, uh, you know, very, very popular, to say, yeah, yep, I'm not drinking, and I'm 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 doing it because I felt disempowered as a woman hmm. to be drinking alcohol, you know, to to really make that association with the kind of patriarchal power structure. It's a it's a new thing, and I'm really excited by it. You know, you were talking about all the reasons that people drink, and fitting into our gender roles that feel uncomfortable is definitely one of them. Um, Holly Whitaker again talks about that bro culture in in San Francisco. You know, you're trying hmm. to advance in the workplace as a woman, and it can feel uh, very isolating. And so if you're not going to the bar for the after work drink, you know, where some of your superiors might be, uh, that's a really difficult position to be in. Uh, so I understand why a lot of women would um, would take to drinking in, in a, you know, with pressure like that. I, I did it myself in the media world in New York City. You know, I didn't want to be the one who, who wouldn't go you know, to have a drink with this media person who might be able to uh, give me some work. That's how a lot of socializing is done in New York City. People, people, you know, they they meet up in bars. That's it's a very common thing, and it's hard not to be part of that culture when, especially when you're you're young and there's a lot of peer pressure and you're trying to get ahead. So I'm really glad that this conversation is happening, and I'm glad that a movie like A Promising Young Woman is out to, you know, kind of kind of spark us to be talking about this. And so glad that you gave space for us to to chat about this on your show. I think it's important, and I think the idea of women not drinking as an act of empowerment, as opposed to drinking as an act of empowerment, which is what it used to be. You know, we used to think that made us powerful as women to go out and have, you know, as many drinks as the guys. I remember when I was a teenager, I was so proud that I could have a shot, you know, of Jack right, Daniels right. and get it down just like a, you know, a dude. That was uh, something that made me feel, made me feel like a, a badass. But yeah, you can be I, just as much of a moron as the men. <laughs> That's a moron as the guy sitting next to me. So it's a really wonderful thing to think, no, actually as, a, as an adult woman, it's empowering not to take that bait and not to drink and to, and to feel incredible control myself and my environment in a way that I really couldn't be when I was drinking. And it's, you know, it's always empowering uh, to set your own rules, right? Yeah. So, and not to abide by the rules that, especially that men have set for women, but that anyone else has set for us. So uh, Lynn Paramore, thanks for writing about that. Thanks for writing about the stock buybacks. Uh, and it's always great talking with you. So thanks for coming on the program. Wonderful to talk to you and looking forward to the next time. 
as am I. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and you're listening to The Zero Hour.